Okay, uh, hello, I'm Nabil Iqbal. And in a previous video, I uh, explained to you how um, black holes have an entropy which goes like their area and how that was a little bit confusing. And now in the second part of my gentle introduction to holographic duality, I wanna tell you what this actually means and uh, how we what we think is actually going on. So uh, here is the fact. We now believe that the reason why black holes have an entropy that goes like their area is because there's a very certain precise equivalence between two very different seeming things. In other words, it seems that there are certain theories of quantum gravity that are in D space-time dimensions that are exactly equivalent to ordinary theories of particles, just particles bouncing around in one lower number of dimensions, in D minus one dimensions. Let me just say that again, because it's so bizarre. It says that certain theories of quantum gravity, in other words, curved space times that are fluctuating quantum mechanically, are exactly the same as ordinary theories of particles with no gravity at all, just particles bouncing around, but in one lower number of dimensions. So another way to say this is that if you look at certain theories of particles, they look like they are actually a gravitational theory in one higher dimension, much like if you look at your credit card, there's a little hologram of a bird or something, that is two-dimensional, but if you look at it right, it looks like it's three-dimensional. So this is that is why this is called the holographic correspondence, because a certain thing looks like it just grows an extra dimension when you examine it in the right way. Okay, so this is holographic duality. It's a duality between two very different looking systems. And um, there are by now many examples of this. So this was first understood in this precise form by Juan Maldacena in 96. And I'll now tell you about the most well understood example of it. When I say quantum gravity uh, on a curved space time, the most precisely understood example is string theory on a space time which is called anti de Sitter space in five dimensions. Okay. And anti de Sitter space is just a certain kind of space time that is particularly simple to understand from this point of view. And it turns out that this quantum gravity theory is exactly the same as something called SUN Yang Mills theory in four dimensions. Okay. So there are, it turns out it also has a property called supersymmetry. There are a lot of words here, okay, which you might not know. And so in what follows, I'm going to try to explain some of these words to you and explain to you what they mean. But before doing that, I'll just say one more set of somewhat intimidating words. This is what is called a conformal field theory. Okay, and I'll explain what that means a little bit as we go. But that's why you'll sometimes hear that this correspondence, the holographic duality, is called ADS-CFT because it relates anti de Sitter space, or ADS, on the gravitational side to a conformal field theory, or CFT, on the particle theory side. But now let me explain to you what these words mean and uh, how this thing can possibly be true. So indeed, it, it should be shocking to you that this can possibly be true. You know, it, it, it sounds bizarre that you have a theory and it can be the same as a different system with one lower number of dimensions. So if you're if you're surprised and maybe a little bit disbelieving, then that's, I think, the correct response. It is a very surprising correspondence, but we are going to examine some aspects of it now. And uh, first, to explain this, I need to first explain to you what is SUN Yang-Mills theory so remember, this is the description on the particle side where you have particles bouncing around, but no gravity. So what is SUN Yang-Mills theory? So let's digest the two different words in this. So first of all, we have an SUN. Let me tell you what SUN means first. SUN stands for unitary N by N matrices. And what that means is just that the theory involves in some way N by N matrices who are unitary if you don't know what unitary means, it just means that um, it's just a property of the matrix. It's not that important for us. But there are n by n matrices involved in this. Now, um, what is Yang-Mills theory? So Yang-Mills theory is a theory of particles that is kind of like um, the theory that describes electromagnetism. So let me tell you a bit about electromagnetism. Let me remind you of that. In electromagnetism, you have electrons and they interact via electromagnetic fields. And if you in include quantum mechanics, then what that means is that you can imagine there's a particle called a photon who mediates electromagnetic fields, okay? So in the theory of quantum electrodynamics that describes um, electrons and light in our own universe, we have electrons and they are mediated, their interactions are with photons or the particles of light, okay? 
you can see me due to photons coming from your screen uh, towards your eyes. Now, yang mills theory is a bit like quantum electrodynamics, just a little bit different, in that instead of there just being one kind of electron or one kind of photon, each of you should imagine that each of these particles has a little matrix attached to it. That's one of these SUN matrices that I mentioned earlier. So each particle moves around with a matrix attached to it. Okay, so here's a matrix worth, here's a matrix, here's a matrix. And in particular, the photon type things that move around also have matrices. And so there are sort of rules for how all these particles with their matrices attached can come and bump together and give you new matrices that come out. But this is the idea of Yang-Mills theory. It's just a fancier version of quantum electrodynamics with a lot of matrices involved. Okay, so um, Yang-Mills theory is very well studied. In particular, SU3 Yang-Mills theory is basically the theory of the strong interactions. In other words, it's the theory that keeps the, that tells you about the internal dynamics of the proton and the neutron. So it's something that is an extremely well-studied theory. Okay, it's called quantum chromodynamics. Now, um, we don't actually care about SU3 for this talk. What we actually care about is SUN. In other words, the number that tells you how big these matrices are, we want that number N to be very, very, very big. We want to imagine basically infinitely large matrices. And the really interesting thing is that when you have these infinitely large matrices, it seems that all the information in that infinitely big matrix gets reorganized in a different way that involves an extra gravitational theory. So let me tell you a little bit about how that's meant to work. So as I just mentioned, when n goes to infinity, the degrees of freedom of this SUN Yang-Mills theory somehow assemble them into gravity in one higher dimension. And um, you know, your basic question should be, how, how can this be? Where is the information of this extra dimension uh, coming from? How is it stored in this Yang-Mills theory? And what's interesting is it's actually stored in a very uh, sort of easy to understand way. So I'm going to call the extra dimension Z, okay, the extra dimension that appears on the gravitational side. And now I want to explain to you how stuff that is localized at different points in this extra Z dimension, how it's stored in this Yang-Mills theory. So a key concept here is the, the idea of scale. So in this Yang-Mills or in this particle theory, it's a fact that we can create structures of different sizes. So let me tell you what I mean by that. Let me imagine taking some of my particles in this particle theory and just sort of arranging them into a circle, okay, of size uh, one centimeter. Okay, so here are my particles arranged in a certain circle. I can do that. And now let me imagine taking these particles and uh, expanding the circle a little bit. So arranging them into a different circle, which is now not one centimeter big, but say 10 centimeters big, okay? That's something that I can imagine doing. So there are two different sorts of structures I can create a small one and a big one. Of course, you can imagine making bigger and smaller and more intricate structures too. Now, um, remember I told you earlier that this was a conformal field theory? When I say it's a conformal field theory, what I really mean is that the structures that I can make on it have different sizes, but there's nothing in the theory itself, like in the, in the empty vacuum of the theory, that tells me what the preferred size is. The theory is agnostic as to whether it likes these guys better or these guys better. Okay. So now it turns out that under the holographic duality, objects who have different sizes in the particle theory are mapped to different locations in the gravity theory. In other words, this little small blue circle will get mapped to one value of this new Z coordinate, whereas this larger red circle will get mapped to a different value of this Z coordinate. So it is the notion of scale in the field theory which is mapped to this extra dimension in this gravitational theory, okay? Sizes are mapped to this extra dimension. Okay, so now here's something else you can do. Imagine taking your particle theory and uh, and heating it up. So we put it at a finite temperature. You, you put it in an oven or something like that. Now, all of these little matrix particles will, will acquire sort of energy from that and they'll start bouncing around in crazy ways as things do when they're heated up. So they'll all bounce around like crazy. And now what happens is that using the holographic duality, what we find is that turning on a finite temperature corresponds to putting a black hole into the curved space-time in the gravitational theory. And uh, the way to see this happens is really, it goes back to Stephen Hawking. Remember Stephen Hawking told us that whenever you have a black hole, you will have a temperature. 
that shows there's some deep connection between black holes and temperature. And indeed, the temperature of the black hole that we get in the gravitational theory is exactly equivalent to the temperature that we put this field theory, that we put this particle theory at on the other side of this duality. So in other words, heating something up corresponds to adding a black hole. Um, when I say black hole, it turns out in this theory, you can also have sort of rectangular black holes that are called black brains. Let me not dwell on that. It's really the same idea. But putting a temperature corresponds to putting a black hole into the gravitational theory. So note that this now explains the enigma of the black hole entropy. This confusing black hole entropy, we can now just think of as being the ordinary thermal entropy of these particles bouncing around in one lower dimension. That is why it goes like the area and not the volume. So this is a, a very deep thing because it means that in principle, all of the complicated mysteries of quantum black holes can be understood by thinking about something which seems much simpler at first, just a hot gas of particles. Now, it, it turns out that if you think about the details of it, it's actually not quite that simple because these particles interact with each other quite strongly and it's a little bit complicated to understand them still, but you can still go an extremely long way and it's a very active field of study. And I will point out that, that right now you can stop listening to this and just go and if you know your statistical mechanics, you can calculate the thermal entropy of black body radiation in two dimensions and you will exactly get the entropy of the black hole in three dimensions. And that just works out perfectly on the nose with all of the factors. It, it doesn't work out quite as well in higher dimensions, but let me not get into that there. It does still mostly work out, but the details there play a more important role. Okay. So now um, let me just summarize. It turns out that through dualities like this, we know quite a lot about quantum gravity in anti de Sitter space, which you remember I told you is a particular space time where this works particularly easy, easily. But um, we don't actually live in, in anti de Sitter space. What kind of space time do we live in? It sort of depends what question you're asking. If you ask about questions on sort of reasonable, normal, um, uh, reasonably small length scales, it looks like we live in flat space. Whereas if you ask about questions that are on the scales of the whole universe, okay, then the universe is expanding and it turns out it's expanding in a way that looks like it'll eventually start expanding um, in a very symmetric manner, resulting in a space which is called the sitter space, not anti de sitter space. So it turns out that um, these two different space times are obviously not the same as anti de sitter space. And it turns out the ideas don't work in quite the same way in these, uh, in these two space times. In fact, it's quite hard to take these duality ideas and make them work in these two space times. Many of us, uh, myself included, think that we might need some profound new insights to really figure out how to take these ideas and make them work uh, in flat space or in the sitter space. So let me just summarize everything that I said. It turns out that certain theories of quantum gravity are exactly equivalent to theories of particles living in one lower dimension and this idea is called holographic duality. And at this moment, this field is completely theoretical. It, it seems that we might need new, new, some new insights coming maybe from the next generation of physicists uh, to help us learn how to connect these theoretical ideas to experiments. Thank you. <laughs>